maybe 120. My Bugatti is currently about 160 hours running in 18 years. So you can't see the crack. You wouldn't find it if I show you this right now, if you don't know where it is. The symptom is water coolant on the tail. If you start to see that, you originally think, well, it must be coming out of the uh, overflow. Probably not. It may be this. And they changed the design. I don't know, and this is one problem with DG, by the way. Where's he go? Oh, Stefan. So the one issue that we all have is an understanding of when design changes were cut in, the serial numbers at which the change was made. Now, with the cylinder head, you can see, and I'm going to tell you what the difference is, but with like the cylinder base gasket, you just don't know. So it would be really good if, if DG could help us understand when those changes happen. You must have that data. Like the serial numbers on the engine and when the design changes from the head yep. and the base gasket stretch forward. I, I don't know where this information is uh, at DG at, at present. Yeah, you don't have to answer it now. But just I'm not, I'm not the technical I know, part. I know. But if we could look it up on the website and they show the design changes in production, that would be really helpful. Basically, you have to, you have to look on the solo web page for technical notes. Uh, yeah, but, but they, yeah, they, don't cover, they don't cover the serial numbers on the engine on, on Well, you do side bring side up speed. a good point. Wait, where's... Yes. Where is... Oh, right, here. Front, right in front of you. Oh, sorry, Paul. <laughs> uh, it's going to be really important for those of us who, who are in the U.S. for Paul to get a really solid relationship with Solar, as well as DG, mm -hmm. for the reasons you're saying. And the carburetor. Well, I haven't thought about the carburetor. Um, I just buy parts and fix it. You think there's a need for that too? Well, it wouldn't hurt for people yeah. to understand that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a it's a pretty short manner, but yeah. still. Okay, fine. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. Both of my heads went bad for the same reason. It's vibration is the cause. And the issue is this, this hole here is not holding the cylinder head down. This here is to hold the brace that comes across the top of the engine, the carbon fiber piece. That is what takes the stress. And the crack, believe it or not, you can just about see, and that is a pencil mark. That's not the crack. See the pencil mark there? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the rear um, one will crack before the front one because that's where the load is. Really. That's probably right. Both of mine cracked, though, at the same time, but um, uh, I mean at different times, but at the same place. Did you find so, out with Uh No, I found out by, here's how I found out. Couldn't find out easily. Didn't know of the problem at the time. I was one of the first to get the problem, at least that I know of. So, yeah, pass that one around. It's clean, you can touch that one. This one here is dirty. Um, so here's how I found it, because I couldn't figure out where this was coming from. So I started the engine okay. yeah. with me standing in front of the wing for safety, and I took a zoom picture, because I couldn't get in close enough. And then I got binoculars. <laughs> and with the engine running, I could see a couple of drips. Uh. That's how I found it. Uh. Uh, but I'll, it's almost for sure, if you have a problem with coolant getting on the tail, it's coming from this. Or on your it'll come down on the bottom where the Ducati, uh, where the uh, yeah, rotor is, it'll, it'll leak down on that over time. So it's, the, not a, it's not a stream, it's like drips. Yeah, it's drips. Yeah, if you want to take a close look, pass it around. And then the fix, and you can tell if yours is fixed or not, there's a new rib which you can't see here, like this. You see this, these ribs? Mm -hmm. There's a new one right in there to brace this against the casting. Yeah, right? they just took out, they just, took out the cast, mm -hmm. sand casting and then they bridged this across. Yeah, so just, just ribbed it in that's there. All good. That's how that was done. So, mm -hmm. that, if you've got an older one, you're going to have to have that, well, you probably will have that problem. What's considered old? <laughs> well, I don't know, because I don't know when they cut the change in, but I would say somewhere in the mid-2005, 2008 range, okay. they, they cut in the change. So they knew about it, no question. Okay. In no particular order. Let's work it out for you, Paul. <laughs> Look at these next, that's dirty. Uh, so, the, anybody recognize these? You do, I know. <laughs> these are the uphaul strut front and back mounts. These are for isolating the engine away from the, the, the airframe. So on this one, you can see it's, the rubber is, is torn away. On this one, that hasn't happened, but what's happened is there's a, there's a metal bush in there and the bush is worn. So whether it be the rubber that tears away or the metal bush insert, um, they, they wear out. And the way you can tell, you grab the mast and when it's up and pull it back and forth. And if the, if the play is excessive, that's probably what it is. You can tell by move it and look, and you can see this thing's got a lot of slop in it. They're going to have a, a certain amount, right? Probably that much. If you pull the mast about that much. But if it's that much, then you've got a problem. 
and, and I've had those machine, those bushings probably five times, and it's metal on metal on metal. Yep. Bolt yeah, on, I have too. And yeah. it's, I've, I've got a fix now that I did that's not factory. I machined at a 90 durometer urethane rod and it replaced that metal bushing. So now it's metal on urethane so on metal, and it took care of that problem. Yeah, completely. that's probably a smart thing to do. This is another one from the same assembly. You've got the uphaul mass, which is the big motor and the big shaft. Then you've got the um, counterbalance gas strut. So that's what these are. So the way you can typically detect it is the tearing layer, and the other thing is to grab the mass and pull it back and forth. Right? About how many hours do you see something like well, that? Well, this is more, uh, this happens to me, what do you think, about every maybe less than 50 hours, 25, 30, mm -hmm. 40 hours? I've had machine new ones about every 20 hours until I put that yeah. Yeah, it's, thing bushing It's in. fairly consistent. Because okay. just the vibration. Okay. Yeah. The center bushing you replace with your thing? I'm machined yeah, out a 90 durometer. Uh, that's not factory, though. But I know, but that's works. actually a good point to take back. Because um, Buzz Graves, who should have been doing this thing, his presentation, <laughs> Buzz is a really savvy dude out of the San Francisco Bay Area. He's been racing go karts all his life, and they're very similar. He, he actually wrote me a little note saying, Remember to tell everybody what you just said, which is metal on metal is going to be a problem with vibration. And we have huge vibration. That is the big problem. If you could cut the vibration, these things would be sweet. The vibration, so you've got to combat vibration all the time. And if that bushing was Delrin or something, you may not have as much of a problem there. Right? I, I wouldn't use Delrin. Well, whatever, the, whatever you plastics tech guys know. <laughs> Fine, okay, that's <laughs> the example. Was the reason why uh, everything. Yeah, and, and uh, you can see get the, That one's relatively yeah, clean. Anybody, yeah, pass that around in case anybody wants to look at it. This one here is not too bad. Um, okay, broken belt. That's how they break. <laughs> catastrophically. Now, the DG manual says, the maintenance manual says, replace the belt every 50 hours. I talked to DG 10 years ago as to why, and they said because when they did their certification, the prototype only had um, 50 hours on it. You have, to um, you have to conduct a test run of at least 50 hours to get the whole power system approved. Okay, that uh, explains it, yeah. And that's why all um, parts that are um, used during this 50 hours also get this 50 hour lifetime. Yes, okay, well that, that's good to know. But are you yeah. doing on condition replacement in, your, in Germany or a 50 hour replacement? Uh, no, that's still a 50 hour replacement. Okay. Well remember in Germany they're a lot more restricted. You don't have the experimental class, do you? We have this uh, permit to fly class yeah. more or less, but this class is only meant to to close the gap between uh, prototype stadium and certification. Gotcha. So with the permit to fly, you're not allowed to uh, to fly a glider 10, 15 years. Um, it's only a vehicle to get certification. Uh, Short term, got it, okay. Well, generally in Europe, they have a lot more, shall we say, anal attitude towards certification and compliance and such. So my point is, there's no logical reason, from an engineering point of view, why you have to change the belt at 50 hours, because <coughs> they're fully inspectable. If you look at this carefully, you can see the actual belt, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And Gates, that makes these belts, have a wonderful description of how to inspect these belts. And they have specific photos, what's acceptable and what isn't. So you can absolutely manage the quality and the reliability of this belt by condition, like you said. It's not to the regulation that DG has in the maintenance manual. Um, but in the US, DG maintenance, or any, any aircraft maintenance manual, uh, it's not quite as rig rigidly um, mandatory as it is in Europe. So anyway, my point is, they break if you do something, quote, wrong. And in the case of doing something wrong, what that really means is, if you try and start it with too rich of a mixture, <laughs> it will backfire. If it backfires, the belt breaks. And it could be at one hour or a hundred hours. It's got nothing to do with age, that's right. So this happened to me because I was trying to be clever. Another thing everybody should know that doesn't have one or maybe just got one, they take quite a while to start. You crank them, you crank them, maybe about five, six seconds. Mine always starts, but it always takes six seconds. So I was trying to cut the seconds down and increase the prime. Well, I overdid it, and guess what happened? Boom, broke straight away. And when they break, you better have your hand on that throttle because it otherwise overspeed and then you, then you really shot the engine. So, but as you can see, that belt, I think I did this about, it was probably around the 50-hour mark. 
but you have a look at it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it except it broke. And I'd recommend leaning it or cutting the prime interval down. And if you need more prime, you just push the button again. Each time you push it, it'll prime. Better that than over prime and break the belt. Which yes, exactly. Can I creep up. I'll make a comment. Yep. This shows that why this would be exceptionally dangerous if you did an air start. Well, it that's interesting. In I've never heard of one breaking in the air. And I think the reason is you've got the windmilling effect going on. Not yet. Counter counter no. Nobody's ever broken. I've never heard of one breaking ever, in the air. Ever. Is anybody else? No. no. Stefan? Usually only during during ground. The, okay. the first start of the day is the most. Uh, that's right, because uh, that's when it's cold. Uh, dangerous. Prime going. Or after an abort, if you start to, you know. Mm. Didn't on the ground, want, though, not the air. On the ground, didn't want to yeah. make a few Maybe, years yeah. ago. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because after if you, an abort. You don't, I always shut the primer off after I've run the first one, if I restart. Run it without the primer on the second starting a little primer. There's a, there's a big difference. Is, so this is also something that has uh, significantly improved during the last years. Is that right? When I started at DG, we had uh, these uh, fails regularly. And yep. With the new gliders now, um, I don't know. Is it the the the, uh, the quality of the engines or I don't well, know? Well, I'll tell you one the, thing that did happen, and some of you will know this. DG couldn't figure out for a long time why this was happening. They eventually figured it out. The primer constant in the DEI instrument, if that is set too high, and it has to be set for each individual glider, there is a default, but it's not always correct. So if you think you're too much priming, go in there and change your default setting for the prime. So DG backed off on the, on, on, on the constant setting. So there's less prime, so less chance of backfire. And if you go to altitude, you want to reduce that interval too, because you'll be over rich at altitude. Yes. Yes, that's and then right. they've also changed the gate belt to a blue yeah, tooth on them. They may have changed the whole belt type on them because they look yeah, a lot different now than they, they do. do. Yeah, they've gone to Kevlar. Are, are these Isn't belts designed specifically for glider no, applications? No, no. 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 In fact, like DG will sell you one for a lot of money, but you can get exactly the same belt with. Let me just have a look back a second. Uh, there's one, one difference I'll get to, but you can buy one in the U.S. from industrial supply houses. The main application is air conditioners on mm. commercial buildings. Okay. Exactly the same. Right. You just need the part number. Right. The only difference is, DG, do you still do this? Shaves, shaves these ribs Spoon off back. the back, yep. which doesn't do anything either way. And DG has said you can um, fly them okay with these ribs, but you still take the ribs off, don't you? Yep. Yeah, that's the difference. I don't why? know the technical reason. Yeah, sorry, I don't either. I just wonder why. There is a well, reason why this uh, this little teeth are uh, uh, sanded down. Well, um, obviously the belt, you know, is this long, right? And it's going like this, and it's got rollers through yeah. through each side, right? Probably to protect the, the roof for the small. Yeah, rollers. so it probably it may wear the rollers faster. Although I've never had a rail, roller I've faster. I've had 50 hours on of engine run time with that type of belt. I've never had no, it wear on the small rollers. So you know, you can certainly save a lot of money if you if you buy that bike buy that belt from an industri industrial supply house. Let me ask a quick question about, does anyone else here have a vendor application? Ventus. Yeah, a vendor. Well, I've got a Nimbus 4. I have, I have the prototype solo installation in the Nimbus 4. Okay, because, um, just so you know, there's a different fix for this on the vendor application. Yeah. Okay. Oh, is that right? Oh, oh, you oh yeah, talk there, there's, there's a slip clutch. Sure. You know, yeah. so they have a slip clutch in DG as a, as a technical note you can add too. Yeah, Same thing. Yeah. There is only saw. four gliders playing with it. Really? Yeah, you know. yeah. Terry. Again, a note on the belts. Yes. Uh, Gates a few years ago changed the material in yep. the belt. Yep. That might have been part of it. Yeah. it originally, it was, it's my understanding, it was a Kevlar based material. Last, last now they call it a carbon belt. You can tell the difference. The carbon one has blue, blue. color yep. to That's it. right. Yeah, this is the original, I believe. <coughs> yeah, so they did change the formulation on the belt when they went to the blue belt. I wondered about that. So. Anybody else want to look at it? Pass it around. No? I've got one, but... Oh, okay. Um, All right. I'm just doing this randomly because, like I said, we aren't really prepared to do what we're doing, but we'll, you'll get the information anyway. Who knows what that is? You know. Oh, it's the track cable? Yes, the extension cable. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thrust cable. The cable from the back of the propeller. The hub <laughs> takes the thrust <laughs> down to the fuselage. Yeah. Um, actually, that one, I mean, it's broken only because I cut it off. Um, and a yeah, I saw, I saw, yeah. I, yeah, that's right. I did. There was a hair. Yeah, you got it. And a hair it makes it illegal, right? You can't no, have a hair no. sticking out. Uh, there it is. It'll grab your <laughs> finger. So that's why I replaced it. So you should really watch and inspect this really carefully for hairs, you know, mm -hmm. little, little wise. So anyway, the other thing to watch for these is. Occasionally, not very often, maybe once every five years, 
check the angle of the uphaul with this cable tension. And it's, um, it's 89 degrees, isn't it? Uh, well, it's which one? Actually, actually calls it like, I don't know, it's one, two, three. It, it's, one, it's one degree away from 90 yeah. anyway. So that's worth um, keeping your eye on because it's a bit subtle. But in any aircraft, if you've got a hair coming off on a cable like that, that makes it unairworthy and illegal, actually. And on a side to that, on the bungee retract, you want to probably replace that periodically or you'll be flying along and wonder why this banging is in your tail boom. Okay. Because that cable will be banging around if the yeah. bungee's not enough tension on it. So keep that replaced on a regular basis. Okay, we've got to speed up to get through this. Oh, we've seen this. Is, is, this, is this good for uh, everybody? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> well, we have everybody knows that. what that is, right? That's the <laughs> exhaust interconnect between the manifold pipe, which bends up and down, and the exhaust uh, muffler, which does not. So this is a little tiny piece in between. Actually, if that's the front, this is the way around it is. And it's quite tricky the way it works. When the engine goes up, this comes up and the exhaust goes in here. Well, the key here, there's a, there's a weld back there. It's underneath. You can't see it easily, but if you get under there with a the mirror, you can easily see it. And if you catch it before it fully breaks, you can actually weld it. This could be repaired. This is expensive. This thing was like more than that. Yeah, 300, maybe it was 300 euros, but it's about 500 bucks. Yeah. Uh, pretty expensive piece. Yeah. So occasionally run your finger under there, occasionally you look with a mirror, not once an annual, once every month or so. And if you see a crack starting to develop, get it welded. I could weld this, but I got a new one. That's an old style though. The new, the new style is totally different. This flange, this heat, heat flange is gone now and it's just straight in on this bell housing because okay. the reason being there's flexing going on there yep. and it'll crack that. And the new design just gets rid of all this and okay. it's the same thing. Well, they're probably fixed. And they still crack. This. They still crack. Do they? Yes. Well, I'll show you a reason why. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do that. Here's a good one. No. Okay, everybody knows what these are, right? This is the this is the magneto. Uh, well, it actually does a lot of things, but it's the center of the rear of the engine. It connects to the crankshaft. Uh, this is actually John, John Hodgson's old one. They're real dirty, so you don't really want to touch them necessarily. But what the reason I'm getting less these than, out? Less than 20 hours. Yeah, yeah. Look, look, mm -hmm. um, yeah. He's got tw 20 hours on it. 491501. Two of these wires. One's 491. One's 501. And they went bad. That's why this is bad. This, the, wire broke. the way this changed, this one is, well, not early. His is 2005. It went from this design to this design. You see the difference? All that goopy stuff all over it? An epoxy. So, because usually most of them fail amongst all this wiring. Usually it's not out here. It's in deep in there. So it's tough to repair. I actually repaired mine about four or five times, but in, in yeah. the end I gave up and got the new it one. Did exactly the same. Did it? <laughs> well, the new one, which I don't have here because it's on my glider. Actually, I do have a new one in, in my new box. This is all the bad parts. But your new one, they extended all this epoxy. It's now completely covered, and it's kind of a white color. So if you have the rear flywheel off and see this, you'll know which one you've got by looking. And I'll tell you, it's worth considering, if you've got that one or even that one, it's worth considering getting the new one prophylactically. You know what that word means? <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'll, bet, I'll bet half these Americans don't. <laughs> you have one in your pocket? To, 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 to prevent, to prevent yeah. trouble later on, it's worthy of upgrade. I'll tell you, the heartache I've gone through with the old design, I've probably had, I bet I've had five or six failures of that in 18 years. And I've had a new design failure on it too. These, are, these two coils are two sets of ignition coils, if you don't know, and this is the generator coil. Right. But I had a, I think what probably was happening is a layer short developing in one of the ignition coils. I was getting a hard start, and it was uh, just getting harder and harder. I finally measured the, the resistance across that, and it was dropping. So I think some of these internal layer shorts was making that. As long as you had the RPM going, it would start right up, but it wouldn't start very well on the ground. So Where are you buying new coils? Uh, these have to come from DG because they're very specialized parts. Yeah, they're dual ignition, so the, the, yeah, that's a Ducati motorcycle it's part. Yeah. It starts off as Ducati, but DG does a bunch of stuff to it. Okay. Um, no, if you're really we smart... We get it as it is from, from Zola. 
Oh, you get from Solo. Okay, yeah. well. They are mounted on every engine. Yeah, that's engine. true. So, so Solo we, gets it from Ducati. Yeah, they're, Ducati's making it probably somewhere. Yeah. We um, get it from Solo with, yeah. a, with a certificate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we install and, it. Yeah, yeah okay. Well, how do, how it cost so we much? Do not, we do not modify these parts. Yeah, okay, so fine. But yeah, they were made of Ducati, I'm sure, like that with the dual yeah, ignition. Probably. Yeah. Okay, how, did, how, did, how does that manifest itself? How did you know uh, you had oh, a problem? Yeah. No, that's a very good question. Yeah, I'm at the wrong end of this subject. Quite often, in fact, I think everybody sooner or later is going to have electrical problems. This is one of the major root causes. There are several others, which maybe, Terry, your picture is going to show the wiring harness and where you can point out some of the normal places. Yeah, I think I can. Okay, well, good. The point he will cover is on the wiring harness, there's about two or three places that are prime suspects. If you don't know the prime suspect, you go chasing ghosts all the way down the wire, you rip all the thing apart, takes ages to take apart, takes a hell of a lot longer to put back together again. And it's really critical to dress the wires properly, again, because of vibration. So be very cautious about tearing into them. If you can get a hunch as to where the problem is, you're far better off. Um, and I may have, yeah, I've got another part into the box I'll show you that will help you understand that. So yes. The manifestation of this is weird things happening, like the generator light stays on, like you fail a mag check, things like that. Those are the symptoms, mm -hmm. and it almost always is going to be in the wiring. Luckily, it's generally not in the major components, like the big DI box, which is hugely expensive, right? Um, so you don't want that to go bad, and mostly they don't. It's usually in the wiring or this little, this little bugger right here. Right? Would, it, would it be, if you have one of these two older designs, Yep and you happen to have the flywheel yep. off for some reason. Would it be a good idea to put resin on there? I, on the, on I mean, it's probably, if you mm -hmm. experimental, it's not illegal. I don't know about the legality of doing that on a certified glider. If you feel comfortable doing it, obviously you've got to clean the hell out of it first. But it might be worth trying. Uh, yeah. See if that gets you out of trouble. I've repaired them and put it on. It still breaks again underneath. Oh, really? Like bridged across. Yeah, there's some... Yeah, it's... It'll, it's it's, just, it's vibration again. It's, it's like 90 volts, mm -hmm. but it... Yeah, and that's something I want to add also with the gust struts and yeah. so on. Oh yeah, I'm going to come to we have We have engines where you don't have to replace uh, such parts for 100 hours. Yep. And there are engines that need a replacement after 30 hours. Yep. So it all is about vibration. Mm -hmm. and yep. uh, the, uh, the engines are not all the same. There yep. are engines that are yep. vibrating yep. terribly and there are engines that are yep. running so smooth. Well, let's just talk about that a second. <clears throat> the root cause of that, of course, we've all, well, some of us have spent a lot of time working on this because, the, the, again, vibration is the biggest enemy. The root cause is quite tricky. For example, vibration, as you may know, is a matter of harmonics between different components. So you've got the source of the vibration and then the amplification or the damping, depending on what all the parts are. So that's one big issue, which is very variable and hard to figure. It's, it's just art, it's not science. Um, and then the specifics of how the wiring is dressed, um, if the bushings are loose and they allow vibration, those kind of things. And another big one is the RPM that you taxi at. Now the manual says 2500 RPM, it still says that, doesn't it? Um, my, my manual says Maybe that. We fly from grass, so you, uh, 2500 yeah, is not, not enough, enough. anyway. So. Well, most people I think would, would <laughs> agree, you want to be about 3000, Terry, you agree? Yeah. They, they yeah. tend to be smoother at about 3,000. The other thing is, don't taxi any more than you have to. Uh, I've got a great big runway at Mindern, and frankly, I usually take off midfield. And I know people say that's crazy and it's unsafe, but I'll tell you, I've, I've, I've um, checked this. I could take off and climb in that one half a runway, adequate by the end of the runway to turn around and get back. If you taxi all the way down, almost half the engine runtime is taxi time. And that's when the worst vibration is. Mm. So avoid taxiing. Okay, these things. There's, There's one thing you should do while taxiing when you do it on a hard concrete runway, it's okay. But there are also old runways or grass run runways and then just mount a camera on the wing and have a look what the what the engine yep. dome is doing all the time yeah. when you, yep. when you ro roll over a bump and that's yep. all vibration and, and force on the system yep. that's not necessary. I, I always tow mine out if I'm running. Yeah, I know. And I, then I do just too. raise the engine and go. Yeah. Okay, struts. I won't bore you with too much detail. We all know what they are. There's, there's at least these three, maybe there's four. Um, this is the uphaul gas strut, which counterbalances the weight of the engine going up and down. And the way you know this is bad, it's subtle, but you need to know it. it. You have to be very precise on the time it takes for the engine to come up. Assuming you've got decent batteries, it's going to be 11 to 13 seconds. Time it at least once every 10 flights. 
if it gets a little outside, only a second or two, 14, 15, this is probably bad. And no. I, think, I think the tension on that, that's 900 newtons, yep. but I think that's an under tension on it. It really should be closer. Conversely, to your retraction time would accelerate. It actually doesn't extension. make that. I think it's 10 to 12 for retract and 11 to 13 for That's up. why I think the, the tension on that's too low. Yeah, it may be. But it is what it is. And uh, be very careful also. These are dangerous as hell because even the ones that don't work right, they still have a lot of tension. And if you don't take them off carefully, um, this will slam in there and it'll get your finger or whatever. This is a key And when point. it breaks in the air, it's really exciting. <laughs> Sounds like somebody blew up your tail. Yeah, these will snap off right here sometimes. Yep, yep, had they will. that happen, I and have, it's a hell of a noise. I'm on my right fourth one, because I have two other bad ones in there. See how that uniball is missing in that one? Mm. That's, that's another problem that happened. And the earlier ones don't have a pin like that. See that? They don't have a pin. They have a different attachment. That's why you're saying they break off. because you're. Well, they'll pin. break off with a pin, too. I've had the shaft break yeah. right there. They're better than they used to be, but yes. Okay. If you take that pin out, is this threaded to the shaft? I've never yes. taken it out, is it? Oh yeah, it's threaded, it's about yeah. half an inch. The thread. original ones were only threaded. Um, and these then are the that's two. got a red thread locker and then a, a yep. pin drill through. These are the two, one's for the canopy and one's for the gear, landing gear. And again, they're a bit subtle as to when to know, but of course with the canopy you'll know if you're losing, you know, up kind of pressure. And the, the gear, you'll know that because when you pull the gear up, it gets to be really quite hard. Uh, that's how you know. So, gas There's some temperature dependency here, though, isn't there? Yeah, I think it probably is. Yeah. I think they're kind of lazy. Yeah, it's uh, called degrees Kelvin. I forgot that one. Oh, that one. That one's for the um, muffler. The little tiny one down in the muffler. Um, I, I think I replaced that prophylactically. See, it's still got a bit in there. Um, it's always difficult with these things to know when they're bad or good. Um, and that one, I'm not sure. I think I replaced it just because it was 16 years old. Okay, um, we can go on to the other box now, I think. Yeah, let me get the, check it, pass me that, that yellow box. Uh, well, I didn't really go through You're these. The um, uh, let me just um, just cover the, these parts here real quick first. Um, the, these, you, I'll pass these around. Oh, yeah. That There's is the um, prop position sensor, uh, right just underneath the prop. This actually just went bad last year, uh, October 17. And what happens there and how you know it's gone bad, the RPM goes away and or goes intermittent. And the prop position, when it comes up like that, it's supposed to go down, it'll just keep going. Um, so that, that's what this was. It lasted 18 years, so I don't feel too bad. So that also is the RPM yes. sensor? Yes, same, same single sensor. It does that's a lot of different things, too. This, this, this is a failure mode, too, in this, in this yeah, that connector. Kind of so it may not be in the, in the uh, that's, that's just a prop switch. Yeah. You can also steal inside that couple. Mm -hmm. This is an EGT probe, um, which goes about three inches down the exhaust pipe. If you don't have EGTs, it's, it's worth adding. Um, Larry, I'll tell you, he did it with some difficulty in his uh, venters. But it wasn't difficult to, to well, do it, but it was, that's when I noticed the base gasket failure. Yeah, but your, your challenge was you had to get a, uh, a meter to match the probe, which in our DEIs we already have one. That's the only difference. But anyway, okay, that's what that is. Spark plugs, um, it's worth considering replacing these prophylactically too. And the point here is this these metal ones are the ones that are on all the earlier gliders, and I don't know when they changed over, but now they have rubber, uh, which is like this one in here. Oh, there you go. Like that one? Yeah, exactly. That's a 1K. That's a topic reason. on its own. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> I think probably a lot of the problems with that spark plug, the, the vibration yes. stuff, yeah. is yes. from the mass of these. Exactly. This one's rubber inside. That's right. And it'll grip. And I haven't, I haven't had any problems with running these kinds. And these, these are the original 5K, because I think the new ones from DG are now are, uh, 1K, because they, they've changed them to 5K. Now. He's talking about the resistance. Depending on your radio, there are gliders that have problems with, uh, with these. With, in the radio. Yeah, you get a you, in, the, in the radio. And you know, a lot of that, I think, is from poor cap to yeah. spark plug. And you get Actually, the, the Bosch metal solution uh, we had in the beginning, then they told us that they would be not available anymore. So Man. we had to find a, a, a solution. Then we uh, came up with the GKN. Or yeah, this, G one's a, this one's a, this one's different. Well, the new gliders then had GKs. Uh, NGKs. NGKs. Yeah, yeah. 
um, connectors, yeah. and uh, with them we had the problems with the with the radio as well. Yeah. And I've been running these, and no radio problems. Yeah. And yep, no I have two. Yeah, and lucky you are. We had a time where we had four or five DG one thousand one M in a row. Yep, yep. With radio problems. Yep, I know one. And then we found a, yep. a source to get the Bosch connectors again, and with these you have a wear out. Out every I don't know how many hours you should replace them. So these not very many. Yeah, that but type? with with regard to to to, to quality and and uh, what do you call it? shield shielding. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. These, are, these are the best. Well, but we the, have the best uh, um, experience. You get mechanical wear on those on the spark plug because of the mass of them. Yes. Yeah. You'll wear your spark plug gap connectors and you'll be replacing those all the time. I, I had way more problems with those than I've gone to these light. I think, I think it's point, a mass problem. Though. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the point here is this. If you can go to the rubber ones and you don't have radio noise, that's the way to do it. He's, you've done it, right? Mm -hmm. I've done it. Several others probably here have done it. Now, do you do it? Uh, I have a question about this. Yep. In that, uh, on the solar installation in the Ventus that I have, they are some other company, DGLM or something, and they're okay. 5K. Caps. Are you using also 5K? I'm running 1K. I don't think it matters, right? It's not much different. One to five. I would run 1K if you could, you'll get a better spark. Yeah. Right. It still it's suppresses it. It's not and that it, big of a difference. And then okay. a non, All right. and a, and a don't non, worry about it. And a non resistor plug. Okay, let's move on because yeah. we haven't got a lot of time to okay. get this because I know I want to get you. Who knows what they're for? That's new to me. Hmm. Those are for grouping the wing covers. You push the wing cover to the end, <laughs> stick your hand through, put one of these through, and you get a big bundle. I don't have a wing cover. So next time you put it on, if it's windy, oh. you've already got it bundled, drop it over the wing, and take this off, and away you go. That's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is for the, tri uh, for the solar panel. I won't, I'm going to go quick here. That's um, solar panel on the ground, that is. Um, this is the original, maybe later models don't have this. This is the original off-glider fueling system, believe it or not, which is, I never used it. Hey, that's all I use. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, I use the on The I thing don't... about the onboard is, it's completely sealed if you make your own fuel can with a cap that's sealed. You're never gonna get any dirt or water or anything in it. That's why I like that system. Okay, this is Bowden cables. A bunch of new ones. In fact, all these parts in here are now new. These are Bowden cables, which are for several things. Um, the Toe release, the the manual uh, prop brake. Yeah, the manual prop brake, which breaks often. The automatic prop brake, which tends to break often. So you need a bunch of valves. And there. if you have to feed it through, it's, you can solder that in and pull it through. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was saying. This is just what I have left of my factory parts kit, which came with the glider 18 years ago. <laughs> And these are the parts that you don't need to worry about because they don't break. Because <laughs> I've never used any of these parts. Right? So that you don't worry about. Yeah, we can't believe that. We can't believe that. We can't believe the service kit now. Yeah, that's right. So they were over engineers. Yeah, they were, exactly. Well, you see, mine's relatively young, and DG probably hadn't got enough experience to know what was going to break back then. Sure. But now they do. You sure you haven't taken any parts out of that over the oh, yeah. years? Oh, yeah. I, that's that's every single part. That, no, the Those ones are that are in there are the, are the ones that are left. Right, okay, you have taken parts. Oh, yeah, okay. So there were some good parts. Like, for example, prop brakes, we'll get to that. Okay, here's no, one that's going to be... I still have most of mine. Yeah, because you don't fly, yeah. that's why. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one's going to interest anybody who doesn't know. You know what these are, no, Larry knows. You guys know what that is? Mm -hmm. This is the... Hold your glider and you, you will know. This yeah. is the cylinder base, <laughs> the cylinder base gasket. No, these are the ones I took off my glider which are broken. Uh, there's also some other things in there, like, like well, the whole kit actually, the cylinder head. You know, the cylinder head doesn't have gaskets, it has O-rings. But that's what, this is the old stuff, which actually should be in the other box. This is the new ones. These are the ones you need. Now, DG screwed me over on this one because I tore my glider apart to replace the gaskets. They sent me generation two gaskets. This is generation one, this is generation three. There was two in the middle. Two in the middle was obsoleted in favor of three a year before my problem. But then the part system, I still got Gen 2. Mm. So my glider has Gen 2. Where's, they have a, where's, where's the difference between uh, generation two and Generation three? two is not metal. These are metal, like you said earlier. Yeah. These are basically they paper. Like yeah, thing. but as far as I know, they're only paper or aluminum. No, they, they did no. it in between. They the did kind of a composite. Rubber. 
a composite material. I've it was, got a picture of that. Oh, you do? Yeah. Good. This mm. is weak. It this is really strong. Short. It was kind of in the middle. Sure. Mm. But anyway, my second generation, to be honest, hasn't failed. Mm. And I've probably done 70 hours since then, so maybe okay. But they went to the Gen 3, which is these. And now, the stretch bolts. I'm going to show you those. Oh. Yeah. This is basically the kit that you get. These are the old um, cylinder bolts. You know, these are the studs that come up that you stick the... The, the cylinder on then the head. These are the old ones, which as you can see, they're dead straight. See that? You can tell if you've got new ones only after you tear it. You can't see from the outside, right? If you tear it apart, the new ones have thin necked bolts. And the reason is they want to increase the preload on the bolt. So if things over time compress a bit, it doesn't let the gasket get loose and, and blow out. So thin bolt is what you want. They'll sell you a kit, which is these and these, right? Um, and you really, if you don't have this done, inspect very carefully the cylinder base. And it's hard to see. So do it where it's dark with a flashlight and a mirror. And you can see if you've got oil around there or you can see a little bit of gasket sticking out. Or in Larry's case, a whole bunch of gaskets blew out, right? Big, big chunk. When your prop bike's well oiled on every <laughs> flight and it spins around yep. as it applies, that's a clue to. Yep. Okay, just buzzing on. Can we see that? Yeah. No oh, yeah. yeah. Pass them around. That's the new set. DG, to be honest, after I talked them through my, the fact they gave me the wrong ones, they did send me the real ones for free. But there's a good technical note in, in the DG that yeah. talks about replacing yeah, those. Yeah, there is. Um, there's a bunch of little electrical way, pieces. Uh, on, on, I have the same issue on, on the vendor installation, and uh, of course I had the intermediate yeah, you phase did. two replacement. Did they have a technical note on that replacement? Absolutely not. Well, the DG did very well. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, prop brakes. Um, who has not replaced their prop brake? It's going to happen soon. You I don't want. But only because I've only had the glider since June. Oh, yeah, right. It's a DG400. <laughs> well, well, no, 400 ain't going to be like this. No, but it's the same different. idea. No, it isn't. Completely different. Okay. The 400 doesn't have a prop brake. It certainly does. Not like that. No, right? like that. The 400's got a bigger pad to it. Than what these are. Yeah. It, yeah, it's different yeah, design. The arm, the arm and the design. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. Anyway, so I've got here a mix of old ones, new ones, half used ones. The key about this is, and these are like 30 bucks a piece. Typically, if you get a season out of one, you're fairly lucky. And if you get only about four or five flights, it means the brake pad is sticky. And you better look at the mechanism and make sure the biggest thing, the problems that happens there is there's a return bungee that holds it off. That bungee wears because of heat. So you should replace that bungee um, probably every five years or so. Oh, I'd replace it more often. More often? Okay. There's a lot of heat there. Six months. And the other thing is, these are, do not immediately just go on the glider. You've got to form the shape, the semicircle shape, and that's quite tricky to do. So don't just... Piece of emery on the six-inch yeah, grinding wheel. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that. Piece of emery. You can do that. Grinding wheel. Okay. But the problem that's is getting it on really before you uh, yeah. profile it, you can't do it. So, okay, that's that. If you want to look, have a look. But so how do you profile a six-inch um, grinding wheel? Yeah, that'll do it, or a dram or whatever. That's but it's really tricky. You've got to get it just, about right. You just touch it really in. Uh, we talked about carburetor. There's a, there's a carburetor kit. We, you have to buy a carburetor kit, but you only use about two parts out of the whole kit. So these are parts that you don't need, so you don't need to use that. How long do you need, Jim? Or should we continue? Let Terry go and you do it, go afterwards. No, no, I can finish this in five. Okay. Easily. Cylinder head and cil uh, cylinder head gaskets. Mm. We've all got a set of pullers, right? We've got our pullers. Depending on exactly which model you've got, you'll need two of these. Yeah, actually, you need both of these. This one here I made, that's a special one for putting a new crankshaft end seal on, mm. which is. I've got one of those here, I'll show you in a second. Oh, there they are, right there. That's what the end of the crankshaft has that seal on both ends. And those can, I, I've actually replaced one end, the front end. And you need something like that to put it on square. And to get the old one out, you just break it, basically. Drill, drill a hole through it. A yeah. um, whole bunch of nuts and bolts. Uh, I won't bore you with any of that. This one's interesting. Uh, but nobody knows what that is. Water pump. Water pump. <laughs> yeah, but do you know what water pump it is? It's a, it's a Wabasco. Yeah, you're right. It, this is interesting. This is the original water pump, which no longer is available. So if you have a water pump go bad, you can't get one of these. 
the fix is a pain to buy and install. The fix is a completely different motor and pump, different mounting because it doesn't look the same, and it's, what, well, 18 volts, isn't it? So you need an electrical transformer box to get from the 18 back to the 12. It took us three months approximately to find a replacement. Yeah, I know, because, you know, <coughs> obsolescence of our parts is beginning to be a serious problem. This one's a classic example. So if you do have a problem with this, um, and, the, and the problem you'll get with it is overheating, basically, right? I, I didn't actually have a problem. Mine still works. Mine does too. I'll tell you why I have this. This is one that I got from a buddy in New Zealand, because in New Zealand, the rules are really, really strict. And he was mandated to install a new one, even though there's nothing wrong with this one, because of the way you guys wrote the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I said, well, where's your old one? He said, oh, I threw it away. Well, go get it, I want it. So this is my backup. You can't have it no matter what money you've got. It's now a backup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought this if, was a... If you, if you, if you pay old Stefan there for this fix, It'll be close to a thousand bucks, right? I think so. Probably yeah. it's around there. Yeah, because you need the uh, you need the transformer, DC converter, yeah, right. and all that stuff. So, so if you were to buy that from DG, would you get everything you needed to? Yeah. Yeah, you buy the kit. You got to change the glycol mix though, because it's not as much flow out of the new ones as the old ones. So what goes? So you can believe me. For us, it's it's a horror as well because you you make your your all your tests, your engineering on a certain pump. Oh, yeah. And one or two years later, the manufacturer says, oh, the series is over. The car where we installed it maybe is uh, That's a bus gone now. That's off of a bus. I don't know. OK, I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they say, OK, we, we stop production. You can't get it anymore. Yeah, I know. And uh, then we start again. In the DG1001M, yep. we have the third version of water pumps. Do you really? Yeah. yeah. Within mm -hmm. seven years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. OK, let me finish up quick. Everybody, everybody recognizes that, right? Uh, I don't want to see that ever again. <laughs> Loosely called an ignition coil, but it isn't. It's a lot more sophisticated than an ignition coil. There's all sorts of circuitry in there. But it does what normally you'd think of as an ignition coil. Well, this is a classic failure item. You see these, these little connectors, which is kind of bogus, really. Every one of those three wires is broken separately, individual time. And the reason is, it's a very brittle wire. This part is bought by Ducati, or maybe it's made by it's Ducati. It's Ducati, yeah. And so they design and build this stuff for, for motorcycles and stuff that doesn't vibrate like we do. So these wires are very, very weak, and they crack and they, they break. The harness that, D, that DG uses is a lot more robust than this. So usually this is a very high failure point. Right there, just that first inch, and it's vibration, and it's bending and all that. It's a multi-stranded wire, but it's very cheap wire, it's brittle, it's horrible. So I did this temporarily, of course, temporarily lasted a while because it happened three times. Um, and, so then, and then you can tie wrap all these out and it'll keep that vibration down. Yeah, it's, that's it right. A lot. Yeah, the the dressing is a big deal. There's a brand new one, which looks about the same, and it's got the same, see, it's exactly the same, but I do carry a brand new one. There's what the new um, stator looks like. This is my brand new spare. And like I said, I had one of those fail, the brand new version. The same type of failure as the old ones? It, it, was, a, it was a harder to start, and it ended up, I think it was a layer shirt within the, the ignition coil part of that, because the resistance was dropping on one side slightly. So I'm guessing all the wraps was, it was sorting in there and dropping their resistance so the voltage would jump up. Because that's a, the, a function of RPM is your AC out on that. It gives you about 90 volts out at RPM. Okay, I'll, I'll just one more thing and I'll quit then. This is obviously is the air cleaner. This is not the standard air cleaner. This is the uh, yeah R1080. This model here is the R1080. It's about twice as big as the standard one. Standard one works fine if you're at low altitudes. If you're at high density altitudes, it's not so good. They they start to starve for air. And at least two guys I know. I haven't had this, but two guys I know. Got out on the runway, went to take off, and couldn't get over about 4,500 RPM. Came back, of course you don't take off with that, right? Came back, we scratched heads, dicked around, took the standard air cleaner off, it was about that big. Got full RPM. Put this back on, 4,500. So it was clear this was the problem. So now, some of us go to this one, the R1080, which is not DG approved, 
technically it's not inside your paperwork, but it works a hell of a lot better at high density altitude. It does just touch a component when it lays down. It doesn't hurt anything. Mm, mine doesn't do that. Yeah, it doesn't it? Yeah, mm. mine doesn't do it either. Okay. Mm. The other thing is... In Switzerland, the guys do the same. Oh, they do? Yeah, yeah. same reason, probably. So this is K&N R1080. I don't know which, which they use, but... Oil. Yeah, I was going to say that. You can't yeah. know that there are customers that change the effort to, uh, to get a better performance in their altitude. Um, so let me just say one more thing there. K&N has a cleaner and an oiling kit. I don't use any of it. I leave them dry. Okay. Because first of all, we don't have a big problem with dirt. Because once you're off the ground, of course, there's not that much dirt in the air. And the second thing is, if you if you gum this thing up with oil like you're supposed to, it reduces the airflow again. Yeah. So yeah. I keep them dry. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah it's okay. It's not going to be except good. except there's a I mentioned a small issue when it comes to the factory, it's pre-oiled. And uh, uh, so mine's, I think mine, mine was. Was it? So yeah, mine should was, be. I just I just installed it. Yeah, well, if you put them in a little can with some, with some with some gasoline, you can quickly get rid of what's in it. Okay, I better let Terry take over here. Uh, Let's see some more parts. Here's an interesting part. Oh yeah, this is good. That's the wrist pin on a piston. Feel that. Feel that. You can see it. Wrist pin on It was running just fine. I replaced the base base gasket, and when I pulled the piston, you could wobble one piston around. The other one was solid. That's the only indication I had. I've been running it like this for a long time. The bearing was perfect. It ran fine, no vibration. And for some reason, the case hardening failed on one piston. The other one was perfect. And uh, kind of chewed up the top of the piston and hit the, uh, the uh, cylinder head a little bit. But the, the, the cylinder itself is plated, so it didn't do any damage there. But I replaced both pistons and had a mass balance, mass balance so they were within. But you had no symptoms, did you? Ah. No it was running fine. Now, eventually, yeah. it would have gone. It would have been pretty cost, catastrophic. Right. That had been running a long time like that. Yep. And. Uh, yep. Anyway. Okay, Jim. Okay. Here's yeah. another source of vibration, possibly. Here you go. That's an engine hold down bolt. That's a 45 degree uh, chamfered Allen head bolt. That hold, there's four hold downs on the front of the engine, and there are two of them look like this. And they had backed yeah. out. And they yep. were rubbing on the starter plate. Yep. From behind, you couldn't observe I, it. I on. had that, and the engine, as I was putting it away, as soon as I pulled the power, I, it, it quit. I was lucky it quit like that. It seized. It seized Otherwise, I might still be... Well, this had been the... running for a long time, yes. like that, with two bolts. The, the, the only reason I could find it was when the engine was almost retracted, right. so there was weight on that side, and I heard it rubbing. Otherwise, it was turning over fine, everything was fine. As soon as I took the power off, the prop froze. Yeah, this one, I've been flying it, obviously, like a long time like this. And those are, those are blue thread lockers on this, so I would recommend if you ever have to replace that engine, that uh, taking it in and out, really carefully clean the thread holds and use, use maybe the primer and then and, use and, the blue, and new and blue thread locker. And now the starter ring gear doesn't have holes in it. You have no way to inspect it. You have no way of inspecting no it. Inspect. Okay, let's move Anyways. on because of time. Great. So I'm going to leave all these parts here. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end if everybody wants to look and we play may, stuff. We may have